So you see, all I'm trying to say is that the basic common sense about the nature of the world that is influencing most people in the United States today, the fully automatic model, is simply a myth. If you want to say that the idea of God the Father with his white beard on the golden throne is a myth, in the bad sense of the word myth, so is this other one. It's just as phony and has just as little to support it as being the true state of affairs. Why? And let's get this clear. If there is any such thing at all as intelligence and love and beauty, well, you found it in other people. In other words, it exists in us as human beings. And as I said, if it is there in us, it is symptomatic of the scheme of things. We are as symptomatic of the scheme of things as the apples are symptomatic of the apple tree or the rose of the rose bush. Well, you found it in other people. The earth is not a big rock infested with living organisms any more than your skeleton is bones infested with cells. The earth is geological, yes, but this geological entity grows people and our existence on the earth is a symptom of the solar system and its balances as much as the solar system in turn is a symptom of our galaxy and our galaxy in its turn is a symptom of the whole company of galaxies. Goodness only knows what that's in. But you see, when as a scientist you describe the behavior of a living organism, you try to say what a person does. It's the only way in which you can describe what a person is. Describe what they do. Then you find out that in making this description, you cannot confine yourself to what happens inside the skin. In other words, you can't talk about a person walking unless you start describing the floor. Because when I walk, I don't just dangle my legs in empty space. I move in relationship to a room. And so in order to describe what I'm doing when I'm walking, I have to describe the room. I have to describe the territory. So in, in, in de describing my talking at the moment, I can't describe this just as a thing in itself because I'm talking to you. And so what I'm doing at the moment is not completely described unless your being here is described also. So if that is necessary, if in other words, in order to describe my behavior, I have to describe your behavior and the behavior of the environment, it means that we've really got one system of behavior. That what I am involves what you are. I don't know who I am unless I know who you are. And you don't know who you are unless you know who I am. There was a wise rabbi once said, if I am I because you are you, and you are you because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. In other words, we are not separate. We define each other. We're all backs and fronts to each other. You know, uh, you can't, for example, have two sticks. You lean two sticks against each other and they stand up because they support each other. Take one away and the other falls. They interdepend. And so in exactly that way, we and our environment and all of us and each other are interdependent systems. We know who we are in terms of other people. We all lock together. And this is again and again the serious scientific description of how things happen. And any good scientist knows, therefore, that what you call the external world is as much you as your own body. Your skin doesn't separate you from the world, it's a bridge 
through which the external world flows into you and you flow into it. Just, for example, as a whirlpool in water, you could say because you have a skin, you have a definite shape, you have a definite form, all right? Here is a, a flow of water and it suddenly it does a whirlpool. And then it goes on. The whirlpool is a definite form, but no water stays put in it. The whirlpool is something the stream is doing. And exactly the same way, the whole universe is doing each one of us. And I see you today, and I recognize you tomorrow, just as I would recognize a whirlpool in a stream. I'd say, oh yes, I've seen that whirlpool before. It's just near so-and-so's house on the edge of the river, and it's always there. So in the same way, when I meet you tomorrow, I recognize you, you're the same whirlpool you were yesterday. But you're moving. The whole world is moving through you. All the cosmic rays, all the food you're eating, the stream of steaks and milk and uh, eggs and uh, uh, everything is just flowing right through you. When you're wiggling the same way, the world is wiggling, the stream is wiggling you. But the problem is, you see, we haven't been taught to feel that way. The myths underlying our culture and underlying our common sense have not taught us to feel identical with the universe but only parts of it, only in it, only confronting it, aliens. And we are, I think, quite urgently in need of coming to feel that we are the eternal universe, each one of us. Otherwise, we're going to go out of our heads. We're going to commit suicide, collectively, with courtesy of H-bombs. And... Uh, all right, supposing we do, well, that will be that, and there will be life making experiments on other galaxies. Maybe they'll find a better game. Well, now, I was discussing two of the great myths or models of the universe which lie in the intellectual and psychological background of all of us. The myth of the world as a political, monarchical state in which we are all here on sufferance as subjects of God, in which we are made artifacts who do not exist in our own right. God alone, in the first myth, exists in his own right. And you exist as a favor. And you ought to be grateful. Like your parents come on and say to you, maybe, look at all the things we've done for you, all the money we spent to send you to college. And uh, you turn out to be a beatnik. And you're a wretched, ungrateful child. And you're supposed to uh, say, sorry, but um, I really am. But you're, you're definitely in the position of being on probation. So that, that idea of the royal God, the king of kings and the lord of lords, which we inherit from the political structures of the Tigris-Euphrates cultures and from Egypt, the pharaoh Amenhotep IV is probably as Freud suggested, the original author of Moses' monotheism. And the, certainly the Jewish law code comes from Hammurabi in Chaldea. And these men lived in a culture where the pyramid and the ziggurat, the ziggurat is a Chaldean version of the pyramid, indicating somehow a hierarchy of power from the boss all the way down. And God, in this first myth that we've been discussing, the ceramic myth, is the boss. And the idea of God is that the universe is governed from above. 
But you see, this parallels and goes hand in hand with the idea that you govern your own body. That the ego, which lies somewhere between the ears and behind the eyes in the brain, is the governor of the body. And so we can't understand an assist, a system of order, a system of life in which there isn't a governor. O oh Lord, our governor, how excellent is thy name in all the world. But supposing, on the contrary, there could be a system which doesn't have a governor. That's what we are supposed to have in this society. We are supposed to be a democracy and a republic. And we are supposed to govern ourselves. And yet, as I said, it's so funny that Americans can be politically Republican, I don't mean Republican in the party sense, and yet religiously monarchical. It's a real strange contradiction. So what is this universe? Is it a monarchy? Is it a republic? Is it a mechanism or an organism? Because you see, if it's a mechanism, either it's a, a mere mechanism, as in the fully automatic model, or else it's the mechanism under the control of a driver, a mechanic. If it's not that, it's an organism. And an organism is a thing that governs itself. In your body, there is no boss. You can say, you can argue, for example, that the brain is a gadget evolved by the stomach in order to serve the stomach for the purposes of getting food. Or you can argue that the stomach is a gadget evolved by the brain to feed it and keep it alive. Whose game is this? Is it the brain's game or the stomach's game? It doesn't make, actually, they're, they're mutual. The brain implies the stomach, the stomach implies the brain, and neither of them is the boss. You know that story about all the limbs of the body? Said, uh, the hands said we, we do all our work, the feet said we do our work, the mouth said we do all the chewing, and here's this lazy stomach who just gets it all and doesn't do a thing. <laughs> he doesn't do any work, so let's go on strike. And the hands refuse to carry, the feet refuse to walk, the mouth refuse to chew, and said, now, we're on strike against the stomach. But after a while, all of them found themselves getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker because they didn't recognize that the stomach fed them. So, there is the possibility then that we are not in the kind of system that these two myths delineate, that we are not living in a world where we ourselves, in the deepest sense of, our, of self, are outside reality and somehow in a position that we have to bow down to it and say, as a great favor, please preserve us in existence. Nor are we in a system which is merely mechanical and in which we are nothing but flukes trapped in the electrical wiring of a nervous system, which is fundamentally rather inefficiently arranged. What's the alternative? Well, we can put the alternative in another image altogether. And I will call this not the ceramic image, not the fully automatic image, but the dramatic image. Consider the world as a drama. What's the basis of all drama? The basis of all stories, of all plots, of all happenings. It's the game of hide and seek. You get a baby, what's the fundamental first game you play with a baby? You put a book in front of your face and you peek at the baby like this. The baby starts giggling. 
because the baby is close to the origins of life. It comes from the womb, really knowing what it's all about, but it can't put it into words. See, what every child psychologist really wants to know is to get a baby to talk psychological jargon and explain how it feels. <laughs> but the baby knows. You do this and this, 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 and the baby starts laughing because the baby is a recent incarnation of God. And the baby knows, therefore, that hide and seek is the basic game. See, before, uh, w when we were children, we were taught one, two, three, and A, B, C. But we weren't sat down on our mother's knees and taught the game of black and white. That's the thing that was left out of all our educations. That life is not a conflict between opposites but a polarity. The difference between a conflict and a polarity is simply when you say about opposite things we sometimes use the expression these two things are the poles apart. You say for example with someone with whom you totally disagree I'm the poles apart from this person but your very saying that gives the show away. Poles. Poles are the opposite ends of one magnet. And if you take a magnet, there's a North Pole and a South Pole. Right, chop off the South Pole. Move it away. The piece you've got left creates a new South Pole. You never get rid of the South Pole. Things may be the poles apart, but they go together. And you can't have the one without the other. That's the basic idea of polarity. But what we are trying to imagine is the encounter of forces that come from absolutely opposed realms that have nothing in common. When we say of two personality types that they're the poles apart, we are trying to think eccentrically instead of concentrically. And so in this way, we haven't realized that life and death, black and white, good and evil, being and non-being, come from the same center. They imply each other, so that you wouldn't know the one without the other. Now, I'm not saying that that's bad. That's fun. You are playing the game that you don't know that self and other go together in just the same way as the two poles of a magnet. So that when anybody in our culture says, uh, slips into the state of consciousness where they suddenly find this to be true and they come on and say, I'm God, we say you're insane. Now, it's very difficult. You, you can very easily slip into the state of consciousness where you feel you're God. It can happen to anyone. Just in the same way as you can get the flu or uh, measles or something like that, you can slip into the state of consciousness. When, when you get it, it depends upon your background and your training as to how you're going to interpret it. If you've got the idea of God that comes from popular Christianity. God as the governor, the political head of the world, and you think you're God, then you say to everybody, well, you should bow down and worship me. But if you're a member of Hindu culture, and you suddenly tell all your friends I'm God, instead of saying you're insane, they say, congratulations, at last you found out. Because their idea of God is not the autocratic governor. When they uh, make images of Shiva, say he has ten arms, how would you use ten arms? It's hard enough to use two. You know, if you play the organ, you've got to use your two feet and your two hands, and you play different rhythms with each member. It's kind of tricky. 
But actually, we're all masters at this. Because how do you grow each hair without having to think about it? Each nerve. How do you beat your heart and digest with your stomach at the same time? You don't have to think about it. In your very body, you are omnipotent in the true sense of omnipotence, which is that you are able to be omnipotent. You are able to do all these things without having to think about it. When I was a child, I used to ask my mother, of course, all sorts of ridiculous questions that every child asks. And when she got bored with my question, she'd say, darling, there are some things we're just not meant to know. And I said, will we ever know? She said, yes, of course, when we die and go to heaven, every God will make everything plain. So I used to imagine that on wet afternoons in heaven, we'd all sit around the throne of grace and say to God, well, now, why did you do this? And how did you do that? And he would explain it to us. Heavenly Father, why are the leaves green? And he would say, because of the chlorophyll. And we'd say, oh. <laughs> but in the Hindu universe, you would say to God, how did you make the mountains? And he would say, well, I just did it. Because what you're asking me for when you ask me, how did I make the mountains, you're asking me to describe in words how I made the mountains. And there are no words which can do this. Words cannot tell you how I made the mountains any more than I can drink the ocean with a fork. A fork may be useful for sticking into a piece of something and eating it, but it won't, it is, is no use for, for, for imbibing the ocean. It would take millions of years. So it would take millions of years. In other words, you would be bored with my description long before I got through it, if I put it to you in words. Because I didn't create the mountains with words. I just did it. Like you open and close your hand. You know how to do this, but can you describe in words how you do it? But you do it. You are conscious, aren't you? Do you know how you manage to be conscious? Do you know how you beat your heart? Can you say in words, explain correctly how this is done? You do it, but you can't put it into words. Because words are too clumsy. And yet you manage this expertly for as long as you're able to do it.